wanted to welcome everyone to the 2017 uh, Women, Peace, and Security Conference. It's really great to have you here. So I, in my career of 30-some years, I fight wars for a living. And I do it on behalf of my nation. When they've asked me to kill other people, I'm thankful to God that I did my duty. But it creates turmoil in my heart and my soul because I always wonder about our ability to prevent the conflicts. And when people ask me, where would you spend another dollar if you had it, I used to think about, well, we need another destroyer or another flux capacitor or another hygromulator to carry us over the edge. And then I participated in a, a lecture series that was created by our great faculty here at the college. We have an evening agenda for the spouses of the students. And the very first lecture was taught by Professor Mary Rom. And it was about women and security. And now my answer is completely different. I don't need any more hygromulators or flux capacitors. We certainly do as a nation. But if I personally had one more dollar to spend, I'd spend it on educating a woman or a female child. Because that's where the future is. That's where the most impact would come. It's extraordinary what the statistics show about the potential in our world if we just together reach out and grasp it. Conferences like this, I know, will illuminate some of those ideas. And it's a great privilege, and it's quite humbling, honestly, to have an, uh, the opportunity to address this group from all over the world, people like-minded in their perspective of this quest for peace and security. So it's a real privilege for me, but it's also a privilege and an honor to introduce Professor Mary Rom. So the professor's been doing these conferences for quite some time now. God bless her. And this week, we elevated her professorship up to be the chair of Women, Peace, and Security. Ladies and gentlemen. I'm really thrilled that um, Admiral Harley could stop by the president of the Naval War College um, to address all you folks. I keep this very short, and I would like you to know um, Commander Andrea Cameron in the corner is going to be your MC for today. So Andrea, thank you. We have a very special guest here, Ambassador Judy McLennan, who was the first um, ambassador to the UN in women's issues. Women. First representative thank to you. the Commission on the Status of Women that had the um, rank of ambassador. Great. And she just flew in from Ireland. So we're really happy to have, have her come. Um, welcome everyone. We have several nations represented this year. We have NGOs, we have academics, and it's a great group. Um, I love your genuineness, I love your work, and it's really good to have you all in the same room. And I'm going to turn it over so we can get going with panel one. Commander, thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Andrea Cameron. I'm here to help you get whatever you can out of this event. So if you ever need anything, please don't hesitate to come see me over here on the side of the room. I want to take care of a few notes of administration, and then we'll get right off into the event. First, I'm going to be your timekeeper. So we have lots of panels and lots of great discussion today. The, the general rule of thumb is 15 minutes. We have bathrooms. So our first break will be after our first speaker and the panel. The bathrooms will be to your right, and then there's a hallway to the left. The women's bathroom is on the second floor, and the men will go up or down to the third deck or the first deck. And if you want a refreshment during the break, you'll go to the left, through the flags, up the beautiful flight of stairs with the red carpet, and I believe most of you saw the, the coffee and refreshments that'll be here. That's also where lunch will be served this afternoon. Wanted to make a quick note about the speaking rules for this engagement. We are under non-attribution, which means that the presentations of every panel speaker is not to be attributed to them. The Q&A will be under Chatham House rules, and if you are being interviewed, it will be a one-on-one, -on -one, and you'll be fully aware that you're being interviewed and it could possibly be on the record. Our schedule is very full today, 
So we will have the first guest speaker, Rosa Brooks. I'll introduce her in a moment. And we'll have our first panel, then we'll have a break. We'll have our second panel, and we'll have lunch. And lunch is a twofold event. We have all of the food that will be provided in the Mahan Rotunda. And we'll also have a voluntary showing of a movie here within this room. After lunch, we'll have a couple more panels. And then all of us are invited over to the Admiral's quarters for a reception, which will also include food for a light meal. Before the evening guest speaker, we have a lecture series here at the Naval War College, and we have Nobel Peace Laureate Lema Bawe, who will be speaking to everyone, and we are all invited both to the reception and to the event tonight. So as you can see, it's a very, very full day. We start today with our speaker, Rosa Brooks, and I get the honor of introducing her. She has had high-level positions both within the Departments of State and the Department of Defense. She's worked for international human rights NGOs. She's a tenured law professor at the Georgetown University Law Center and a proclaimed journalist in print, radio, and television. Her most recent book, How Everything Became War and the Military Became Everything, shows how she has become one of the top experts on national security and the changing nature of modern warfare. She has traveled the world, and she brings all of these perspectives to her call today. So we are looking forward to your insights on our theme of women, peace, and security. Rosa Brooks. Thanks so much, Commander Cameron, and thank you to Mary Round for inviting me and to Admiral Harley for, for uh, kicking off this conference. It's a real honor to be here. Uh, I think the, the excuse for having me here is that years ago, in the early days of the Obama administration, uh, Women, Peace, and Security was part of my portfolio in the Office of the Secretary of Defense. So at one time, I was very up on all of the details. It hasn't been my main focus in the last few years, but it's terrific to get back to thinking about it. Uh, and I just wanted to say how, looking around this room, how, how happy, how happy and proud I am to see all these amazing, tough, smart, creative, experienced women sitting here in this room, uh, and a few men, um, and just how delighted I am when I look at the list of speakers to see the incredible range of tough, smart women experts on this issue. I'm so happy and proud of that. I'm also just heartbroken by that. I'm heartbroken that here in 2017, at a conference on women, peace, and security at the Naval War College, almost everyone on all the panels are women, and almost everyone here in the audience are women. And I salute those of you who are men who, who came here and, and talk a little bit more about, about why. And it's very similar to the themes that uh, Admiral Harley raised uh, in his short opening remarks. Uh, it is incredibly depressing to me, so heartbreaking to me, that 402 years after uh, after some of the first feminist manifestos were written, uh, 225 years after Mary Wollstonecraft, nearly a century after women's suffrage, 54 years after Betty Friedan wrote The Feminine Mystique, 25 years after the United Nations proclaimed International Women's Year, I remember standing with my own mother on a stage at International Women's Day in 1975. Uh, it remains true that when most people hear the phrase women, peace, and security, the only word they register is women. It is still, for all the unbelievable work the people in this room and in so many other rooms here and around the world have done, uh, this remains something of a fringe issue on the security agenda, something for the girls to keep busy with, something for the women to care about something towards which senior leaders uh, make occasional rhetorical flourishes, uh, well-meaning rhetorical flourishes, but generally feel that they do not need, feel, need to make central to their own lives, central to their own objectives, uh, that they can leave it to the women to do the vast majority of the studies of the impact of gender on security, of the impact of gender on economic development, and so on and so forth, the impact of gender on conflict. Uh, and I don't mean to be overly grim this morning, um, particularly so early in the morning. It's never, never good to depress people too much uh, when they haven't had enough coffee anyway. Um, because needless to say, after all, there have been unbelievable achievements as well. 
Um, 200 years ago, in most US states, women were considered largely a form of chattel. Women couldn't own property in their own name in most US states 200 years ago. They couldn't sign contracts in their own name. Their husbands or their, or their brothers or their fathers had to do it for them. They couldn't enter the medical or legal professions. Uh, less than a century ago, uh, there were virtually no women doctors or lawyers, uh, no women, women in the US Senate or the House of Representatives. The only women who would have been here on a US naval base would have essentially been the wives and the occasional maid or cook. Uh, marital rape was lawful in most states in the United States. Things are pretty different now. Uh, we have, a, we have female four-star admirals. We have female Marines and FBI agents and police officers and physicists uh, and CIA agents, wrestlers, Supreme Court justices, members of Congress. We've had women secretaries of state. Uh, you name it. Uh, there are women who have done it. Not quite president, right? But, but we're getting there. Uh, We've had women national security advisors. Uh, the majority of university students in the United States today are now female. Um, and the same, we've seen similar progress all around the globe, needless to say. Uh, remember, it was only, only just over 100 years ago that women first got the vote in, in, in Norway. Uh, and since then, uh, the change has been unbelievable. You know, when you think about the last few millennia, uh, in which women were essentially second-class citizens, and men were often not considered citizens either, but the rise of human rights in general, it has been a rising tide that has lifted all boats, and, and we've seen substantial improvements in the status of women around the globe. Uh, today there are women leaders all over the world. Um, today we have seen uh, uh, dramatically increased attention to these issues in virtually every country around the globe. Uh, so that's all good. So it's not, it's not all bad news. We can, it's been a lot of progress, particularly in the last century, needless to say. Um, but I don't want us to kid ourselves. And, you know, I, don't, I know I'm speaking to the choir here in this room, but the, the challenges that remain are just staggering. Uh, you know, I think of Malala, that Pakistani girl who was shot by the Taliban just for speaking out uh, for women and girls' rights. Uh, I think of Saudi Arabia, our ally, in which women still can't vote in national elections, can't drive, can't get passports without, public, without their husband's consent, can't swim in the same swimming pools as men. I think of northern Nigeria, where it remains lawful for men to use force for the purpose of correcting their wives. Uh, I think of the Russian parliament's recent action uh, reducing uh, the protections for victims of domestic violence by eliminating criminal penalties and making, the, making it a civil offense. Uh, I think of the Syrian and Iraqi refugee women in refugee camps in Western countries and in France and in Greece and Germany uh, who say that they can't go to the toilets in the camp or the showers for fear of being raped or sexually assaulted. Uh, globally around the world, women make up 70% of victims of human trafficking. Uh, nearly half of female homicide victims are killed by members of their own family, compared to only 6% of male homicide victims. And, you know, I could recite statistics, I'm sure you could too, until we get even more depressed, but, you know, globally women are more likely to go hungry than men, women and girls. They are less likely to finish high school, finish secondary education. Um, they constitute 40% of the global workforce, but women around the globe still earn less than men for the same work. Uh, only a quarter of national parliamentarians around the globe are women. Women make up only about 10% of heads of state around the globe. Sexual violence remains rampant, particularly during armed conflicts. Uh, and women suffer disproportionately in all sorts of ways during armed conflicts. Um, when I worked on the National Implementation Plan for Resolution 1325, uh, when I was at the Pentagon uh, uh, only seven or eight years ago, I, however long ago it was, uh, we were obviously focused on identifying things that the US military and the Defense Department could do to advance the women, peace, and security agenda. Uh, and I think that we have made progress. I think that the US military in many ways has actually been a leader in this area. Uh, that being said, uh, globally, things are still pretty grim here too. Uh, women are still often shut out of peace negotiations. Um, 
the statistics on the inclusion of women in peace negotiations still suggest that although things have gotten substantially better, women make up a tiny minority. Only 2% of chief mediators in all peace agreements negotiated between 1992 and 2011 had women as chief mediators, uh, and women made up only 9% of all negotiators. Uh, here in the United States, too, uh, for all our women secretaries of state and women national security advisors and female generals and admirals, women also are a small, small minority in the national security field and foreign policy generally. Uh, the ratio of uh, men to women in national security jobs in the U.S. government is roughly three to one. When you get to the more senior levels, that ratio gets a whole lot worse. Uh, the percentage of women in the U.S. military shot up after the creation of the all-volunteer force, uh, but has been largely stagnant in the last 20 years. We haven't seen a substantial increase. And this, this may change. I'm actually quite optimistic about this with the lifting of the combat exclusion rule. You know, I, I'm, I'm very hopeful that this will bring a new generation of, of young women into the U.S. military now that they see that the career paths open to them are the same as those open to men. <coughs> but nevertheless, um, I do think things are going to get worse before they get better, actually, on most, most fronts here. Uh, I think most of us sitting in this room were probably very inspired in, in January. We saw the women's marches around the world right after the presidential inauguration. It was, it was just amazing to see women in, in almost every U.S. city, in Antarctica, uh, in cities around the globe, women and men turning out to say, hey, women matter too, we need to fight for this particular agenda and other agendas that have to do with women's issues and other forms of equality and fairness uh, around the globe. It was unbelievably inspiring, but of course, what inspired it was not terribly inspiring, right? I mean, we, 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 have, a, we have a US president, uh, and I, I won't make a partisan comment, but I will note that, that his record on women's issues is, is not stellar. Uh, we have a president who has use disparaging terms like slobs and pigs and dogs to talk about women he, with whom he has disagreements uh, uh, and who during the campaign uh, tape emerged in which he suggested that sexually assaulting women was an acceptable form of behavior that you can get away with if you're a powerful person. Uh, and that is just staggeringly depressing. And I think we've also seen for those of us who thought, well, you know, it doesn't, we've got a whole big U.S. government and whoever's president doesn't matter that much. Well, it turns out that whoever's president does matter quite a lot in all kinds of ways, and I, I'm sure you're reading the, the news with as much uh, attention and anxiety as I have, but, but we've also seen things that in very concrete ways are damaging to the women, peace and security, from the reinstatement of the global gag rule uh, to, to slashes across the board, uh, or efforts to dramatically slash budgets for diplomacy and development, which are going to have a disproportionate impact on women, uh, and, and efforts at the State Department, for instance, to cut some of the very programs that are most vital to pursuing women, peace, and security agenda, from the community of democracies to the uh, uh, position of the ambassador at large for war crimes issues, you name it. The, these, are, these are cuts and policy decisions that will have a disproportionately damaging impact on our ability as a nation to continue to take a leading role in pursuing the women, peace, and security agenda. And here's the irony, right? This is not about us, ladies. Uh, as Admiral Harley said, uh, the women, peace, and security agenda is not about doing a little something for the girls. Uh, this is about the difference between winning and losing when it comes to conflict. It's about the difference between peace and war. It's about the difference between prosperity and poverty, between success and failure in almost every endeavor uh, of humanity. And again, I, I, I don't think I need to tell this group of people about the evidence. Uh, uh, and obviously, causation is hard to tease out, but correlation is, is pretty darn persuasive. Uh, women's participation in peace processes, for instance, uh, studies find that if you have women involved in the peace process, that you increase by 35% the likelihood that peace agreements will hold for at least 15 years. Um, one 20-year study uh, of the percentage of women in parliaments around the globe found that when a nation increases the representation of women in parliament by 5%, 
it becomes five times less likely that country to use violence as a response to international crises. Gender equality is one of the top predictors of peaceful communities, and meanwhile, gender inequality, conversely, gender inequality, is a top predictor of conflict both within states and between states. Um, this is true when you look at economics and development as well. Uh, on studies of Wall Street investors, female investors tend to make less risky investment decisions than male investors, and over longer periods of time have higher returns. Uh, when you look at global development, the single biggest thing, the single, single thing that is most strongly correlated with economic growth in developing countries is investing in education for girls. Uh, you don't need to be an essentialist. You don't need to think that women are just nicer or smarter or better than men. You don't need to think that at all uh, in order to think, boy, these correlations probably are trying to, you know, this is a message that we should be heeding. And maybe it's as simple as, as something that we also know from study after study, which is that diverse groups, diverse teams, groups that have gender diversity consistently make more creative and better decisions than homogeneous groups. When you shut out the large majority of women, when you shut out half the global population from vital decision-making venues, whether it's economic decision-making or whether it is war and peace, matters of war and peace, uh, you're losing a whole lot of talent and a whole lot of different perspectives. Um, and you know, even if you think it is entirely nature rather than nurture, uh, and that many of these differences would disappear over time in a more equal world, and perhaps they would. Uh, but where, where we are right now, women's perspectives are different than men in fairly systematic ways uh, across every country. And including those perspectives has indisputably positive impacts on everything from economic development to the reduction of conflict to success during conflicts. And, and I think others will talk at different points. So, you know, one of the things that we worked on when I was at the Pentagon was documenting the evidence that uh, things like female engagement teams in Afghanistan and efforts to projects to empower women in places, conflict zones in which US military personnel were engaged uh, just made our jobs easier. It's, pure, it's purely pragmatic. Even if you didn't care about fairness, you didn't care about equality, uh, you just had a purely pragmatic perspective that says, we want to be successful here. We don't want to fail here. We want to succeed here. Uh, that the, one of the best things you can do, as Admiral Harley said, is focus on including and empowering women across the board. It's, it's, it's always just struck me as a, as a real oddity, uh, the way in which this issue has always been so marginalized. I, I've always thought, you know, it's funny, nobody thinks that the only people who should do studies on how to prevent cancer are cancer patients, and nobody thinks that the only people who should do studies on income inequality or poverty are poor people. Uh, we all get that cancer, poverty, etc., are issues that affect all of us, and that the wealthy as well as the poor need to care, that the healthy as well as the sick need to care. Uh, so it's always struck me as so very, very strange and sad, as I said, just heartbreaking, that when it comes to issues of women, peace, and security, that by and large, uh, uh, most people, particularly most men, not all, uh, assume that this is an issue that only women need to care about, um, when in fact, I think, as, as we all know, it's an issue that we all need to care about. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop in a moment uh, to see if people have comments or, or questions, and I also I know we're we started a little tiny bit late, um, but I think the you know the theme I wanted to end on is really just we've got our work cut out for us. Um, those of you who are in this room do amazing work, and that includes the men who have taken the time to be part of this and to care about this. I'm not I'm not talking to you guys. You guys already get it, uh, and that's why you're here, and, and it's incredibly important. But I think part of the the biggest challenge that we collectively face, male and female alike is getting past that, that tendency when people hear women, peace, and security to sort of edit out the, the last three words and hear only the first one. Uh, because until we can make sure that conferences like this have an equal number of men and women in the audience, that conferences like this have an equal number of men and women on the panels, and I don't mean that it's not about you know, some sort of affirmative action on this issue, it's simply about our, our, the most monumental part of our job, and I know that people during the course of this conference will be talking about all kinds of issues, uh, from training to the role of the media, um, but I think the most monumental challenge that runs through all of these is 
getting this issue to be seen as what it is, uh, which is, as I said, not about helping women, but about helping all of us. Not about helping women, uh, but about winning wars as opposed to losing wars, about having peace instead of conflicts, about succeeding rather than failing. So thank you very much. Sometimes people do necessarily makes a difference. I think that I think that the same people who tune out when they hear women tune out when they hear the word gender. Um, you know what I think we need to do, and I think it's, it's beginning to happen. And, and Mary's work here is an example: is essentially mainstreaming this information so that it's not just taught in a separate course on women and security, or a separate course on women's issues, or women and economic development, but that it is integral. You know, if you're teaching a course on economic development, or governance reform, or security or peace processes, that it is integrated fully into it. Because, because again, you know, I sort of think of it this way. I try to imagine you know, going up to, a, going up to a, uh, a senior military official and saying, hey, um, guess what, uh, general, or guess what, secretary of defense? Um, I'm an academic. I've just done some research, and it's practically magic. I discovered this thing. You're, you know, you're working on this peace agreement. I discovered this magic thing. You know that will make your piece of work so much more likely to succeed. Do you, you want to know that or not? Um, oh yeah, I kind of want to know about that actually, right? Uh, we don't want people that we. You know, I do worry about language and the way it makes people tune out. Um, I don't know that there's a simple solution to that other than continuing to to in every way possible be making the point that this this is not a special interest. Um, you know, hey Wall Street hedge fund manager, I got a, I got something for you that's going to make your firm more profitable. It's easy. Get a few more women. I can prove it. Bing. Oh, huh. How about that? Follow up on the, on the comment. I just finished reviewing uh, AFRICOM's initiative on this, and it turned into a 20 page article on how women and equality needs to be pushed into the militaries, yeah. rammed down the throat of 
AOR countries. And my first comment is, when I'm looking at this, as she said about the name, it's peace and security. We're using gender mainstreaming to improve peace and security. Again, I can see from the civilian side versus the military side, because I do both as a preservist, contractor, and previous government. So throwing the word in there kills you on the military side of the house. If you go peace and security agenda, and one of the subcategories of increasing peace and security is the initiatives for women in there, and gender mainstreaming, and gender analysis, and all of that, you get a little further with the military as far as understanding. Yeah, and, and my own experience when I was working on this issue uh, within, within the Pentagon uh, was that people were actually very, very receptive. Um, and, and indeed, I, you know, I can remember one, uh, one uh, army colonel who came to one of our early meetings as we were starting our information gathering for contributing the, the DOD part of the National Action Plan. Um, and we, we did a sort of data call. We said, you know, we'd like to show if they, can, if they can help us get examples of good things DOD has done or why this is important. And, and this guy, I don't remember his name, uh, but he came and, and he, 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 after the introductions, he said, you know, I just got to tell you, working on the lady issues was the best thing I did in Afghanistan. And I, and I thought, I thought, well, okay. You know. <laughs> Maybe that's not the terminology I would prefer him to use, but, but he, you know, he was incredibly passionate. He said, when we started working with women's organizations, it changed the outcomes. And I can't even remember anymore what it was that he was working with, it was agricultural stuff or justice sector stuff or counterinsurgency stuff, who knows. Um, but, but you know, I think that we do have a generation of younger military personnel, male, male and female alike, who have seen firsthand uh, uh, in places such as Iraq and Afghanistan uh, that it actually it helps. It helps, and getting those voices out there, particularly when they're male voices, I think I think just given the nature of things, uh, is is really important. So I read the first half of your most recent book on the plane here, and I'm hoping to finish it on the way home. Um, and I really appreciated um, what you had to say in your analysis about sort of the way that war is changing and, and the military's scope um, and and job is changing, and I'm curious within that thesis, what you see that potentially meaning for this agenda, and what sort of challenges and opportunities you see for peace and security given Yeah, all yeah, of that. that's a great question. Um, it's a great question, I don't know if I have a complete answer to it, uh, but, but I do think that, you know, in some ways, just in terms of the, the U.S. landscape, it opens up a lot of opportunities for women. I mean, the, the, the so think of sort of the, the 19th century model of warfare, uh, and indeed it took us through the first half of the 20th century, you know, when warfare is all about mass, right, all about throwing bodies uh, against weapons, throwing bodies against the other guy's bodies, and it's all about physical strength and endurance, um, uh, and involves mass casualties too. Um, there are sort of historically compelling reasons to make it a young man's job. You know, biologically speaking, young men are relatively dispensable. Uh, you don't need that. You need women if you want to keep your society going. Uh, you want to reproduce. You don't need that many young men. Uh, you know, historically speaking, and when it comes to sheer physical strength and stamina, on average, and there are as we as we as we know and as we are increasingly seeing demonstrated by the courageous women uh, going through uh, ranger school and uh, marine basic course and so forth successfully, uh, as we know that there are plenty of women who can do it too, but just in terms of averages, um, that was a form of warfare that, that it was advantageous to be young and male. Um, and increasingly the forms of warfare uh, that occupy the United States, um, even though those you know, old-fashioned forms of warfare are very much still with us, uh, you know, when it comes to cyber warfare, when it comes to a lot of the kinds of tasks involved with counterterrorism or counterinsurgency and so on, uh, you know, the, the, these are these physical strength and stamina are close to irrelevant um, uh, in those particular forms of warfare. And I think it opens up a lot more space for women to become senior leaders in addition to just getting rid of anachronistic and archaic rules that said, you know, even if you're a woman, you can do these tasks, you still can't, you still can't be a ranger, or whatever it may be. 
Um, so so I, I think that in, in that sense, there's some room for optimism. On the other hand, you know, there's always an on the other hand, um, I think that the ways in which the sort of the securitization of everything does tend to push these issues off center stage simply because by force of habit, uh, people think of this, you know, you get this reversion to, well, uh, you know, sorry girls, um, you know, we got to think about North Korea and nuclear weapons. We don't have time for this frivolous stuff about, you know, gender equality. You know, ask me, you know, again, it's the thing we hear over and over, you know, ask me again when, the, when ask me again when the war is over, uh, and then we'll have time to get to that, as opposed to being able to see these issues as absolutely central to, to prevailing. So I, I think it cuts both ways. talked about uh, things being sort of on black and white, you talked about win and lose, uh, and then uh, you, you and, and that's a, that's a, that's a philosophy, right, that's one way or the other, um, and, and then you spoke about um, that things make it worse, right, which one, one could see as in order to have, to win, you also have to have the other side of it, you have to lose too, that's how we evolve, and, and so having, if things are going to get worse, if, if you know, if we put that out there, which put out the positive piece, right, but we're also being um, uh, transparent or down to earth, I don't know what I want to say. But that, 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 that darkness that we may go through is an opportunity for us, and we have to look for those opportunities, and, and that's an opportunity for us to, 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 uh, to move forward. Is it possible that we could think about maybe the philosophy of this a little differently in a line on that? And my, the philosophy I have is that there's a, there's a feminine side of, of our nature and there's a masculine side of our nature. We all have some of it, um, whether we're male or fe female, or whether we have a male or female parts. We're all, we're all pe a pe part of that. Some of us have more of one than the other, and some of us use it at different times, no matter what country you're from and what um, sex you are. And if we oppose it in that sense, if we build from that baseline, perhaps we could Mm -hmm. Maybe it would be the world would be more open to it. Well, I guess I guess I have two two thoughts in response to that. One is I don't really know what it means to have male sides and female sides, or to be feminine or to be masculine. I mean, I you know obviously there are huge debates within the scholarly community about whether there's any such thing, right? And I, I think it's actually really interesting in which the issue of uh, tra transgender rights has sort of brought this up again. I mean. The fight that early feminists made was for you to say there is no such thing as being, you know, women are like this and men are like that. Aside from the roles that society has forced us into, you open up true equality, uh, and a lot of that will go away. Um, it, it's, it's interesting, I, you know, I, as, as someone who grew up uh, in, in a feminist household, thinking about the the sort of transgender rights issue, and I am a strong supporter of transgender rights, I think it's completely irrelevant to everything, every job that matters, etc. Uh, what, whether somebody had surgical procedure to change their gender or sex at birth or not. But that being said, when I, when I hear statements like, well, I never felt like a girl, I think, what does it mean to feel like a girl? Or I never felt like a man, or I always felt like I was really meant to be, and I think, I don't know what the, I don't know what it means to feel like a girl. I don't know what it means to feel like a woman. I know what it means to feel like me, you know, with this particular bundle of attributes and personalities. Some some of which may be more stereotypically female, some of which may be more stereotypically male. You know, and I, I myself would like us to get to a day where where none of us talk about what it is like to be more feminine or more masculine, where we just accept that there is a vast range of, of human traits, and we all. We all have an interesting mix, and some of us have biologically different forms than others of us, and who cares, you know? Um, so that, that's one slightly ambivalent reaction, I suppose. Um, uh, my other reaction is, I, you know, I mean, in dark times there are challenges. Uh, certainly, you know, were it not for the darkness, we wouldn't have gotten the women's marches and the mobilization of many people who don't normally consider themselves politically engaged or active. That's a good thing. Uh, you know, I think of Martin Luther King's famous, uh, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it arcs towards justice. That's very inspiring. The only thing I would say is, 
No, it doesn't necessarily. <laughs> you know, uh, it doesn't arc anywhere in particular unless we make it arc in that direction. You know, and, and yes, what does not kill us makes us strong, but only if we determine that we're going to choose it to make ourselves strong. That I, I, you know, again, I think I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, but the minute we sit back and say, well, you know, the general trend line is upward, that's going to continue, the moral arc is sort of arcing happily uh, in, the, in the beneficial direction, and indeed, you know, the arc of the last hundred years has been overall a good one. But the minute we think there's something inevitable about that continuing, forget it, we're, we're, we're doomed. Um, there's nothing inevitable whatsoever about progress in this or any other area of life. Uh, uh, if there's going to be continued progress, it's going to be something that we have to fight for. 